Good Friday morning. Welcome to Begin in the Word. Today we're going to be concluding our series in James chapter 2, looking at verses 20 to 26. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James continues this section on faith and its relationship with works. And as we think about this, we should remember the context here. James is dealing with those who don't want to do acts of mercy, specifically to to widows and orphans and to mistreat the poor, showing partiality to the rich. That's the context of this. And they think that their faith, the fact that they believe in Jesus Christ, means that they don't have to do these sorts of things. And he's he's really going to throw down the gauntlet this time. He started in our previous text by showing us some of the reasons why that's foolhardy and we can't we can't have that. But now he says, do you want to know, a foolish man? And the word here is shown. And he's calling him a foolish man. In this case, he's really thrown down the gauntlet, as we says. The showing here is, all right, let's do this thing. Let's put this to bed once and for all. And what are they going to show? That faith without works is dead. That you cannot claim to have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't claim to have faith in him and not do good works. Now, how is he going to do that? Well, he's going to go back to Abraham, and he calls him our father. Now, remember, this is written to the 12 tribes which are in the dispersion. And so that's either a primarily Jewish context where Abraham truly was their father, or he is the father of all who believe by faith in Christ Jesus. So this is a great guy to look at when it comes to understanding faith and its importance. And what does it say about Abraham? It says he was justified by by works. Abraham was justified by works, and this goes to the binding of Isaac, his offering of Isaac, his son, on the altar. He's saying that that's when Abraham was justified or part of what made it happen. And in this case, he says that faith was working together with his works, and works were made perfect by his faith. Think about that for a moment here. He's saying these two things are genuinely inseparable. This is the notion we should see from the beginning, is that these two things are are two sides of the same coin, that you can't just look at faith without works. If you don't have one, then you don't really have the other, that there's something that these combine to be that true we might call true faith is the propositions and the actions. These two things must go together, that if we only have the propositions or the facts, or we only have the actions, we don't have true faith as what God is calling us to. If we don't have faith, we're not going to convince those actions of mercy that God is calling us to. And if we don't have works, we won't have the faith that is needed for justification. In the case of Abraham, he needed not only to trust the promises of God, but to obey in offering Isaac. If he had said, I trust you, Lord, but he had not obeyed, this text indicates he wouldn't have been just in the sight of God. It was the completion of that faith by his works that made it a justifying faith. And then James goes on to quote uh, Genesis 15, verse number 6, which is a favorite Pauline text to talk about Abraham's belief, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, or he was counted Righteous and the word for justified and righteous are connected together there as well. And he says this, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only, that these two things um, are both needed in order to be justified. If we say we have faith but we don't have obedience, then we have not labeled that intellectual reality through the biblical lens. We might call it the faith in propositions or mental assent or belief in something, but it's not the faith in Jesus Christ that leads to salvation. Instead, the faith that we must have must lead to obedience. And when we have that sort of faith, the sort of faith that acts with works, we are justified. If you want to get the complementary perspective on this, look at our videos over on Galatians 3, 5 to 9, uh, but also Romans 4. 1-8, to where Paul quotes these texts. You can get Paul's perspective on this text, and I think you'll see there's agreement between all of these things. Agreement between all of these things. And so James gives another example. As though one is not enough, he says, Likewise, likewise was not Rahab 
the harlot. This is a somewhat shocking example of someone who was justified, who stood just and righteous in the sight of God. Now, there have been various attempts to try and Victorianize her, her story, but the evidence seems to be the fact that she was, in fact, a prostitute. However, James is lifting her up as an example of faith and works, that she believed in the power of God and she acted on it. She believed that God had delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea, and she acted on that by sending out the spies. She received the messengers and then sent them out another way. That's how she was justified, was that act of faith demonstrated in her works. James' notion of works here, in this case, we want to note here, has more to do with acts of obedience that follow from faith in Christ, whereas Paul is concerned with acts of law-keeping that are potentially absent of faith in Christ. In this case, Rahab was an example of faith and works together, and one that should be emulated. Tie a final bow on this. James wants to leave us with no questions about what's going on here. If you want to understand how dead is faith without works, how dead is it? Is it a little bit alive? No. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. That if you look at a person in a casket that's not moving at all, as dead as they are, that's how dead our faith is if there is no works in it. Espoused faith that doesn't have actions following it is just like a dead person. It's not that it's totally disingenuous to call it that, but it's missing the most critical aspect. It's missing life. So too, we should be thoughtful about this. As, as we think on what this means, this text means for, for you and me today, it's easy to turn this into a soteriological essay, and that's, that's an important thing. That is, there's a bunch of passages about how we get forgiveness of sins. And while this, this passage belongs in, in the scope of that, it definitely does, let's not get so entrenched arguing about the necessity of works that we forget to do them. And I want to challenge you one final time before we turn to our next text to be a person full of good works out of faith in Christ, to practice acts of mercy for the glory of Christ, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, that we practice acts of mercy for widows and orphans and for the poor, and we serve our fellow man just as Christ did. Thank you so much for joining us today on Begin in the Word. It's our prayer that just as you've begun today in the Word of God, you'll live out today in the Word of God.